distracting. There we go. All right. So Nick, thank you so much for joining us. And I thought we would, you know, start at the beginning just so everyone can kind of, uh, you know, come along for the ride here. When was the first time you actually sat on a horse? Gosh, the first time I sat on a horse was, uh, I must have been nine, 10 years old uh, at a summer camp that I went to. I don't come from a horsey family. So uh, I grew up in, in Los Angeles. So, you know, not, not very conducive to horses and, and certainly not dressage at the time. Um, but I did go to a summer camp that offered horseback riding. And uh, I, I had this immediate draw to horses. Um, so uh, I think I went there three consecutive summers. And by, by summer number two, I asked for special permission to hang out with the horses longer and groom them and, and learn about them. And that was allowed. And so that was kind of how I, I got my, my first love and taste of horses. Oh, that's really great. Uh, how, um, how did you get from there to dressage? Was your, were your parents very supportive or did you have to kind of? No, again, everything kind of happened uh, just through circumstance. Um, I, I fell in love with the horses at summer camp and then uh, asked my parents, uh, let me have a horse. And they looked at me and laughed and said, absolutely not. Um, and so I, I, at the time I had also been trying other sports and not committing to them. And so I think my parents uh, thought I wasn't serious. And so they said, how about you take some lessons and maybe after a year we can talk about it. And uh, so I did. And uh, once a week I took some um, lessons at a, at a little farm we found. And uh, after about a year, I said, okay, I've done it. Where's my horse. And uh, um, they thought a lot about it and saw that I was serious. And so we started investigating what it would be like to have a horse. And I actually have an aunt um, who, who had a horse at the time and uh, an Arabian stallion. And so we got some advice from her and she said, only buy an Arabian, only buy an Arabian. They're the best horses. And uh, so that's what we did. We found an Arabian breeder uh, locally and for $800 got my first horse, which uh, her name was Sarah. And Sarah was a 14 three hand embryo trance for a mare. And uh, she came home with us. And that was my first horse. And because she was an Arab and because of her age and because of her uh, lack of training, the trainer looked at us like, what am I supposed to do with you? Um, and she said, I think your horse needs a little bit more uh, schooling. Maybe go try the dressage trainer here at the barn. And uh, I really didn't know what dressage was, and uh, but I, I we approached him and, and he agreed to give me some lessons. And that's honestly how I got my start in dressage. So uh, I have to thank Sarah for that. And funny story, I was 13 at the time, I think we got her and Sarah lived her entire life with us. And uh, I showed her until I was six foot one. And uh, yeah, so I really, I, I credit it to her. That's incredible. So that's yeah. that one of the next questions is, you know, who who was your first dressage trainer? Talk us through how that how how that all meshed. Uh, so his name is Ludger Thole, and uh, he's German, and he moved to Southern California, and we just happened to uh, stumble upon him by chance, like I said. And uh, unfortunately, he uh, moved away about a year after we uh, moved to that particular barn. And uh, what was really neat about him was that he did have all kinds of breeds of horses in his program, um, from an Arab to an Andalusian to a warm blood. And uh, so I never kind of felt out of place. Um, when we did move barns, and I had to say goodbye to Lutger, uh, we did find another barn that had a dressage trainer, and that was much more um, uh, a warm blood oriented uh, a facility. And so when I showed up as a six foot one teenager on a 14 two hand Arab, the trainer was just like, I don't know what to do with you. So anyway, they they convinced uh, my parents that I did need a, a bigger horse, which was very much true. And uh, so that's how I that's how I got my next dressage horse. Um, and again, not following good advice. Uh, uh, we went to a local breeder of warm bloods and to specifically to look at a, at a more of a trained horse, probably like a third level horse at the time and ended up coming home with a three-year-old. And uh, again, you know, I, I'm here to tell about it, but uh, it, the, it was the blind leading the blind at the time. And so, um, yeah, my, my beginning stages in dressage was, was, was a, a tough one because of just the horses we chose to, to take on, but I wouldn't trade them for the world. I, yeah, there's the the famous quote was at London who said it's the they have the most to teach you. <laughs> They're difficult. So, 
there's a lot of uh of getting notes in the chat of empathetic fellow members yeah. who, who did yeah. not go the traditional route so yeah this is great so can you talk a little bit about um you know starting out you've got these two very different ends of the spectrum in these two horses mm -hmm. um how was that like as a developing rider um what was that like to have go from one to the other yeah i mean obviously going from a from a little arab to a big untrained warm blood was was it was a huge uh hurdle and and new for me but i think that's also part of the joy of being 14 years old and not knowing any better and just going with it um and i i think because i wasn't um in in dressage in the way where i was where I was in a competitive mode and there wasn't any pressure on me um it was just about me and the horse and i i i, I I look back on it fondly and somehow I got the, I got Crystal, her name was Crystal. And somehow I got Crystal to young rider level and ended up trying out for young riders on her and not well, but you know, again, it was, I look back and I think, gosh, you know, somehow we made it there with very little training, uh, formal training. And um, again, Crystal lived in our backyard until, you know, she passed away. And so that really was a, a ch you know, looking back, it was a challenge. It was unfortunate that I wasn't able to be in a situation with a more consistent training uh, program, but school didn't allow it. You know, by the time I left high school or, or, or school to get to the barn, you know, in, in LA, nothing is close by. And so it was the end of the day, the trainer wouldn't stay. So I was riding on my own quite a bit. So it was, really was just trial by error and figuring this out. That's uh, that's incredible. I know um, our young riders these days, you know, there's a lot of webinars and videos to watch and things like that. What kind of resources did you kind of, did you use um, outside of when you could connect with your trainer in person? So, to be honest, I, what I would do is, is uh, on weekends in particular, I would just be at the barn all day long and just watch and watch and watch and, and, you know, envy and, and, and crave to be one of the upper level riders and to see what they were doing. And so I learned just a lot by watching. Um, my first job was at, a, as it was at the local tax shop and uh, they had a video monitor with all the VHS tapes they were selling. And I would always ask if they would put the dressage ones in. And so as I was working there, I would watch the videos and read books and magazines. And, you know, it was just through osmosis. I just, uh, knew that I was addicted to dressage. I, I, I just didn't know how to uh, uh, get closer to the educational part of it at that time in my life. So it was just through watching and 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 doing the best I could. That's great. Um, there's a question uh, coming in that, you know, sure. it's, if it was so difficult and uh, you weren't in the top in the Young Riders, uh, what was it that kept you going? Um, did you ever doubt that you kind of get to where you are today? Or were you just having fun and it didn't matter? What was that like? You know, uh, at the, at being, a, being a teenager, I was navigating so many things, you know, in my life that, did, that didn't have anything to do with horses. Um, so for me, the horses and the barn life was my sanctuary and my safe place. And so that's all that mattered to me at that time. And because uh, I hadn't really gotten a taste of competition and uh, it, that really didn't play a huge role. I, I was I was in awe of the famous writers at the time. I remember, you know, reading about Nikola Poff and, and, and seeing pictures and watching videos and thinking, God, it was magical. But at that particular time, it wasn't my motivation necessarily. It, the horses meant way more to me in terms of just being part of my, my life as opposed to a competitive aspect. So I think that's really what kept me going. It wasn't until after um, I left for school and decided that I missed horseback riding too much that when I came back uh, and actually got a working student position at Gunter Seidel's um, that I got my first real taste of, of competition and, and seeing that that was attainable and, and, and a possibility and I could maybe make a, a career in this. And so then my mind shift changed quite a bit at that point. Can you, can you talk a little bit uh, to us about that, that shift in your, in your mind, you know, your mind, when you realize all of a sudden this national stage is, is kind of on the precipice and, and the challenges become much more, much more critical, I would assume. Sure. Um, so I, like I said, I, I, I was probably 18 years old when I decided to, to leave school and, uh, and I went and started uh, working with Gunter and, uh, his business was just 
very different than the one I, the barn I'd left from. It was a, he was a very uh, highly competitive uh, uh, rider and trainer, at, even at the time and had Olympic aspirations, um, had a barn full of very serious riders. And it was just an environment that I had never been around before. Um, and he allowed me to ride most of the horses. So all of a sudden I was just feeling and experiencing and seeing a whole new level of, of, of dressage and, and talent that I had ever been uh, exposed to. And uh, it was because of him, uh, he had a particular horse in training, a, a stallion. Maybe some people are familiar with the horse named Laylock. Uh, it was a Swedish warm blood stallion that uh, uh, was quite famous, I think, uh, in breeding here years ago. This is a long time ago, um, but was difficult. And uh, I think Gunter didn't enjoy riding him. And so he allowed me to ride him. And I was just so grateful that that was the horse that I ended up uh, taking to young riders and uh, winning the team gold and 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 really, like I said, got a taste of this is what I want to do. Um, I also uh, have to say it was a really cool feeling to be able to get on a horse that everyone else was having troubles with for various reasons and and find a way to have this horse want to do it for me. And so I think that was also a lesson that I learned and something that I really kept with me that that even though a horse might be difficult, uh, there's usually a solution on how to work through it. And so that was a little bit kind of, I think, what gave me a niche in, in the San Diego um, market is that I that I kind of was able to ride some trickier horses. And I also attribute that to maybe the fact that I didn't have a ton of, you know, uh, rigid education. I was always out there by myself trying to figure out how to how to do all this. And so, um, you know, I think I think that kind of works in my favor in some regards. So this um, you kind of your your um, method of going out and kind of just tinkering and figuring it out on your own. Did that kind of stay true throughout your career? You you ended up working on your own a lot. And again, not necessarily by choice, it just it seems to have been one, I think, when your foundation is laid that way, and 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 that's kind of again, I, I I think we all get involved with horses for for various reasons. Um, and because mine wasn't necessarily initially competitive, I really didn't mind the 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 struggle necessarily. I, did, I never saw it as a struggle. And so as each new uh phase in my career opened up, I, I was okay being alone in some regards. And now I, now I had access to clinicians and, and I did, and I did, mind you have, I learned a lot from Gunter and uh, I rode with uh, clinicians when possible. Um, but when you're young and starting out and, and trying to build a clientele, I really kind of was known as the person that would deal with, you know, some of the more tricky or challenging horses. And ultimately, some of the more tricky, challenging clients. And so I kind of got this uh, full business going with, with, yeah, maybe the not so wanted horses and maybe some clients. But that, again, turned into giving me opportunities that I might not have otherwise had. Um, and, and I think that extends then itself into, and um, from, from Gunter, I, I branched out on my own for a little bit in San Diego, but then found a, a, a way to go to Europe. And I ended up going to Europe um, and uh, spent seven years in Europe and kind of did the same thing. I ended up working at a, at a sales barn where the owner had the most amazing young horses and basically said, we need to sell them for a lot of money, get on them and, and, and make them do something. And I was like, okay, let's let's do it. And it wasn't it had nothing to do for me about the money. I just was like, I just want to ride all these horses. Um, and that's what I ended up doing. And that turned into um, uh, me getting the chance to ride some pretty famous stallions and doing a lot of young horse competitions and doing quite well in a lot of the young horse competitions. And, and again, you just, all of a sudden, here's this unknown American kid riding these stallions in these, in these young horse divisions and doing well. And um that's so again, it wasn't because I didn't want to be in a, in a structured program. It's just circumstance didn't necessarily allow that because each time a horse got going, it was sold. And then I started with the next one. So that's kind of it, so fast forward. It wasn't until I maybe reached a, a level with with some of the horses I have now in my life that have opened the opportunity for me to get to work with some people on a more regular basis, like Debbie McDonald and, and of course, and uh, 
which which now as I'm older, I I, I cherish and, and crave all of the the in, input I can get. But certainly, my the beginning stages of my career, I was kind of it was me and the horse and the arena and just figuring a lot of it out. As you might expect from this conversation, I'm getting some questions in the chat about advice for, uh, okay. you know, people who are riding on their own and have these difficult kind of scenarios. So um, how, what is our first question that came in that I think is really interesting is how do you kind of take the frustration out when you don't have anybody else there to kind of see you, see you start to get frustrated, right? Um, how do you have your own kind of check-in process and kind of bring yourself back and go back to basics and um, I think, can you I talk think us through a, a frustrating question. day? I, and and I th I think that's something that uh, all of us you know need to need to know how to do because this is a very intense uh, sport and we spend a lot of money a lot of time and so it's easy it's easy to get frustrated when things aren't going well um, but I have to say the number one thing I've learned to do is is true and it's and the horses have taught me this is that. As cliche as it sounds, tomorrow is always another day. Like when like you can pick up tomorrow, and and once you feel yourself getting to a place that's not productive anymore, as much as our our, our personality says, I want to get it achieved today, you're better off just just finding the wherewithal to, to to stop and 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 start again, or or find a different thing to do. Get off and lunge the horse. Do something that that allows you to take a breath and just decompress. Um, what I do personally, because even, even today at this level that I'm at now, I still ride a bit on my own. I videotape every single one of my rides, every one of my rides on my, on my, on my competition horses. And I have the Pixum system and um, that has become the single best tool that I have because I, it not only allows me to uh, immediately review what I just went through, you know, good and bad. And I can, and I can think, God, that, that's not what I was feeling, or that is what I was feeling. Um, but also it's, it's something that I can share with my other trainer friends or my, my, my trainer in, in, in Europe that I, that I get feedback from all the time. So for those of you that do ride alone, I really do recommend getting a, a video system and, and, and watching yourself and, and, and learning that way is, is a great way to I think keep yourself in check and, and maybe have a more objective uh, view as to what may or may not be going on because you can see it from the outside in. Just to reiterate that, which, which system is it that you use that you like? I have the uh, Pixum system. It is the one that uh, you download an app on your phone and then you have, uh, it tracks you uh, through the arena and it works pretty darn well. And you can also do it for virtual lessons. I've had, I've had good success with that one. Excellent. Thank you. Um, and uh, some similar questions coming in about, you know, kind of your daily moment to moment, uh, daily or moment to moment strategies as you train um, to kind of check in with where you're at. So I, I'm a I'm a really routine person and I really believe that horses thrive on routine and familiarity. So, um, you know, of course, each horse is at a different level. Each horse has a different uh, personality. Um, so, so you tailor, you tailor your program to, to each horse, but I, I ride my horses five days a week, um, three days on a day off and then two days. Um, and, and that, that can sometimes mean a lunging day that can mean a, a, a trail day, but they get, they get worked five days a week and they have two days where they're completely just free of having to do any work. Um, but I usually have a strategy with each horse. I know what I'm working towards. And I try before I get on each horse to have an idea as to what it is I want to achieve that day. Um, and, and as best I can, I try to stick to my, my plan. And I find that horses respond really well to that structure. So um, I, think, I think if you can just visualize before you get on what, what it is you want to feel, accomplish, it, it will help you at least start the ride with the right mindset and intention. Thank you. That's very helpful. So I know we got um, partway through kind of your story, your, mm -hmm. uh, you know, overseas and riding. Would you like to uh, kind of move forward from, from that in kind of your story and, and how you ended up back stateside and, and up to present day? Sure, sure. I, um, 
Uh, like I said, I spent seven years in Europe and uh, um, was doing quite well, but there came a point when I was, I had to make a decision. Do I want to stay in Europe or did, did I, did I want to come back to the States? And I, and I struggled with it, but I chose to come back here. Um, and I had met um, one of, one of my, one of my, she didn't, she's still a, a client friend, a sponsor of mine, but I met her prior to moving to Europe. And when I, when she found out I was coming back, she said, well, why don't you come down to San Diego and set up shop here? And, and I did. And um, that's how I ended up back in San Diego and um, slowly built a clientele here and uh, was able to uh, uh, bring back a lot of the knowledge that I learned in Europe and and uh, help people here with that and through just again coincidence made a couple contacts and uh one being the owners of of don john and they you know said we'd like to sponsor you on a horse and um so we 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 got don john um as a five-year-old and that's really he's really been the horse that has you know kind of taken me onto the international scene obviously um, and, uh, along with that, you know, he's, he's been my most successful horse and he's also, I don't, I'm sure, I don't know how many people have followed it, but I've also been hurt on him twice. Um, and that was a big game changer. And so that really kind of re made me think the, the whole process of what I, what I was doing. And, um, I have to say like, we can get into that as much as you want and if people have questions, but it, that's been my my single biggest challenge in all of this has been conquering the uh, fear and the anxiety that I developed because of those two unfortunate injuries on him. And uh, that's changed my approach. It's changed my approach to teaching. It's changed my, my I think, my outlook on, on what's important. Um, and... I'm kind of grateful that it happened because I think I'm a much better rider, trainer, horse person because of it. Although it's it is a struggle and a and a challenge still to this day for me. I will say there is some interest if you're willing to go there. I think um, some sure. of, if if we could know exactly you know what the incident you know what happened and then mm -hmm. kind of you know how you initially kind of coped with it and then how it how you've progressed since sure. the initial coping mechanism. Sure. So we 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 brought Donjon over as a five year old, and um, <clears throat> he had been here for about a week. And I was, you know, I, I rode him a few times, and everything was fine. And then I went away to teach a clinic, and I remember coming back uh, on the Monday after the clinic, and went to get on him. And silly, you know, to just you know, what wasn't th not even that I wasn't thinking, just didn't think anything of it. Um, and my groom at the time tightened the girth and took one step forward after getting on him on the mount from the mounting block and he i launched me i mean like probably 10 felt like 10 bucks but like i mean launched me like higher than any horses ever launched me and i went flying off and landed on my back and uh remember laying there and thinking shoot i can't move and so there was that thought in my head like if i don't move that means i'm paralyzed and so obviously i wasn't paralyzed but it, I ended up getting a compression fracture in my back and you know, that really rattled me. But that being said, I healed and we really understood it was from girthiness and we created a, a, a plan and we, we got a different girth. And, and when I was able to ride him again, we had this whole routine and like everybody knew you don't ever girth him. You, we, we do a whole bunch of, I would lunge him or I would jog him up and down before I got on him. And we never looked back. It, it didn't, it, it didn't uh, leave my head that there was a possibility that he would do it again, but I really thought I figured out why he did it and we, we could avoid it. Then I think it was probably four years later when I was getting ready to do a CDI. Um, we, we were in the barn area and I was getting on and the, the person who was helping me was not the person that regularly helped me. And so I didn't even dawn on me and they tightened the girth as soon as I got on and the same thing literally happened except this time I was in the middle of a barn aisle on hard ground and uh, he went up and down the barn aisle high jumping 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 I remember Sabine Shukeri was was there and um, um, uh, Anna Buffini was there in the barn aisle and they 
still to this day say we, they don't know how I stayed on for as long as I did. But I ended up falling and broke four ribs and 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 my arm. And that was when um, something in my brain shifted and said, this isn't safe, this isn't safe, this isn't safe. And uh, um, that's truly where I think, yeah, my whole ability to be fearless and and confident on the horse, uh, yeah, got 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 hurt as much as my body did. So I healed. Um, of course, got back on, but then started realizing I was having some panic attacks and uh, I wanted to quit riding. And it was a really, really low point in my life because as I've explained to you, horses have always been such a, a huge and important part of my life way beyond dressage. So struggling with the idea of not riding was, was horrible. But um, I worked with a sports psychologist and uh, uh, had some people in my life that I could confide in and they knew what was going on. And it was through that and, and just through sheer determination and unwillingness to give up riding that I am able to keep doing this, but I could even feel myself getting, you know, sweaty and emotional talking about it now because it is such a real thing. And, uh, the irony of it is, is every time that Don John and I would hit a new milestone, we, you know, we, we made it to Grand Prix and then all of a sudden we were being invited to represent the United States at a Nations Cup in Europe. And and when I should have been ecstatic, I was thinking, oh, no, I can't do this. I can't do this because it was more unknown. It was a different environment. I wasn't in control. And so I, it was a really tough thing to to keep moving forward in my career. But but having my my brain and my and my my, my anxiety trying to keep me back. So somehow we made it to Tokyo with all of this going on, but uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's been a real, it's been the hardest thing I've, I've, I've dealt with in my life for sure. I want to say that there's a number of people reaching out in the chat, just thanking you for being willing to talk about this. Cause it, it's, you know, oftentimes it's something that that's hard, very difficult to discuss externally. You know, you're trying to deal with everything internally and very, very appreciative this group of, of your willingness to, to go there and, and talk about this. Um, well, are you to. able to, are you able to share any particular, uh, you know, kind of concrete things that have worked for you for the anxiety? Because I mean, this is something I would be shocked if there's anyone on this call that hasn't had this moment. Oh, I'm of sure, I'm sure, and and I and I've touched on it in a few articles, and and the response I've gotten has been has been really positive, and 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 thanking me for being open about it. And um, sadly, I was told early on when this was coming through, don't say anything about it because not to be embarrassed by it, but because they didn't want anything to take away from my ability, from my being considered to represent the United States. And um, anyway, so what, what I've learned to do uh, for me, breathing techniques are huge. Um, I was taught through my sports psychologist and, and um, just a whole, a whole way of breathing, of, of monitoring your heart rate. Um, that has really helped me. Um, unfortunately, when I, when I am in a bad space, I, I sleep, I lose sleep. It affects me like that. So I, so I, I end up then being exhausted. Um, so I've had to learn a lot of, of sleeping techniques. Um, but for me, what has gotten me through it the most, which is why I was saying that each time I go to a new environment or a new challenge or a horse show, whatever, where I don't know what the situation is going to be like, um, I've learned that I need to preemptively have a strategy as to what I'm going to do. How am I going to get on the horse? You know, where, where, and where is the location going to be that I'm going to have, have access to lunging, blah, blah, blah. And so as long as I'm able to be positive or, or have proactive uh, steps in my mind, it, it, it does help me conquer the unknown situations. Um, but I, to be honest with you, uh, you know, time has, 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 has healed me the most. Um, but I have a new, you know, I'm, I've gotten a few new young horses in that I'm super excited about, but it is conjuring up some of these feelings again, because you're on green horses that you don't know that that are unpredictable. And it's, and it is part of, of riding a horse 
Um, I know that, but it's hard when your brain is is not cooperating all the time. So um, for me, it's really just been one talking about it. I have, I my husband is amazing and my best friend is amazing and they know, um, as, and this has happened recently, I'm like, okay, at 1030 in the morning, I need you to be accessible by phone because if I am feeling anything, I just need to voice it. And so just having those kinds of things to to release it with has helped me quite a bit. That's great. Thank you so much. That's so helpful. Um, I think <laughs> a big support uh, support group here at uh, Nita if you ever need it. <laughs> oh, <laughs> a lot of thank a lot you. of thank yous in the chat for that. Thank you. Um, Appreciate it. And then can can we kind of pivot a little bit and discuss perhaps your understanding of the internal workings of the mind of the horse and how it is that they learn. Um, for example, you know, you kind of had have, have this big episode with uh, Don John, and how mm -hmm. did that? manifest and how do you you know you have your own issues to deal with there but then how do you then also work the horse through um the horse through that kind of that kind of event so with that with don john it really wasn't behavioral in terms of, it wasn't a training issue i mean we really did it, it is it is truly a girth issue so um there wasn't anything to to for his learning process there because as soon as as soon as the pressure was gone he was like you're fine um what did interestingly happen is because of my nerves and because of my fear, he started developing um, fear of other horses. And so I started, which had never been an issue, but he started shying away from other horses in the warm up arena. And I thought to myself, gosh, darn it, this is me creating a, an unwanted behavior in him. And I had to learn again to give him the confidence that I normally would when I wasn't having doubts in my own brain and it was remarkable to see that behavior dissipate so um, horses certainly pick up so much just from our state of mind our state of emotion and I think that's been a real um, eye-opener for me through this particular um, challenge of my life because prior to this I might be the most insecure person everywhere else in my life, but on a horse, I was, I just, I just never had fear and never had doubt. And I think that always uh, created that same confidence in the horses I was riding. And all of a sudden I felt myself taking away the confidence of, of, of the horse. And that really made me think about, okay, this is not okay. You've got to, you've got to give the horse the confidence. And so that's how I think how horses learn. They pick up so much from us. Like I said earlier, they really respond to consistency um, and structure. And like I, you have to tailor that to each and individual horse, but I, I, I teach so many clinics and I watch, and if it's somebody I've never worked with before, I always say, I'm gonna sit back and I'd like to watch you warm your horse up normally and just get a feel. And it's fascinating. You, you can pretty much guarantee by how somebody warms up their horse, how the rest of the ride is going to go and not and not because of their talent or 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 the skill level but simply because you can tell certain people have really created a a system that makes sense to the horse helps the horse get warmed up or or acclimated to the environment um, and there's a logical progression and other people come in again sometimes a grand prix rider sometimes a training level rider and i sit back and i think if it's not making sense to me watching you navigate your warm up i can't imagine that it makes sense to the horse and it's and again it has nothing to do with with being a bad or a good rider it's just how we approach each and individual session and and so i i i think to the one question prior about frustration i think i think we always have to remember that the moment our emotions get involved with our riding there's going to usually be a negative impact on the horse and if we don't have a good sense of what we want to accomplish there's no way the horse is going to and so i think those and and and, and stop me if i'm if i'm rambling but it also takes place on the ground i think horses really need clear boundaries on the ground while we while we do it on them and love them and they are pets and i also know how happy horses are when they understand what the expectation is when they're in the cross ties they are there to be there when they're trailing to lunging to to hand walking and 
And it's the, it's the horses that don't get that clear education that end up struggling in terms of behavior. And then, and then it just becomes a, 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 a snowball effect from them. So. Can we, um, thank you. Can we dive in a little bit to what you're saying uh, as the, the system in the warm up that kind of helps the horse structure and, and be pointed toward the goal? Can you um, just for some of us kind of point out, for example, this would not make sense versus this would make sense? Is it possible we could dive in I mean, there? Sure, sure. I mean, I, I, I have a very specific logical progression. I have a feeling that I want to have in my hands. I, I want the horses to stretch all, all the things we know. But I, but I, but I have certain markers in my in my warm up that, and I teach my students the same thing that we need to uh, be able to do. And so, um, you know, it starts at the walk. Do you, can can you can you walk both directions and can and can your horse stretch and 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 do you have contact? Um, picking up the trot, doing the same thing at the trot, and then and then and then progressing. But it's 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 consistent geometry. It's 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 riding clear with intention and 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 you know it, it would be so much easier if we actually had a, a horse in front of us to, to do this with but i think i think a good analogy that i gave a, a student of mine uh last the last clinic and i said i'm watching you ride and i said i can't imagine you would drive your car like this and she said huh and i said i said i said if you were i said if i was if i was a driver in the same on the same street or the same parking lot or the same freeway that you were I would have no idea where you were going, and and it, and it, this is again, it's not an insult, but it, but she would speed up and slow down, and if I would say, okay, let's change direction, there was no thought in how she changed direction. She would just, you know, whip around and, and change direction, and her frustration was, why is my horse not cooperating? Why is he why is he not going on the bit easily? Why am I having these struggles? And 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 part of it first was you're just not giving him clear directions, and so whatever the struggle may be that you're having with your horse, just fixing it or, or working on a, on a contained area or a circle. If you're riding a circle, make sure your circle really is a circle. If your intention is to change direction, think about how you wanna change direction. And I know that sounds maybe pretty basic and simple, but, but, I, but when I use that analogy with her about how she, was, how she would not drive a car like that, it really changed because then she, because I would say to her, I said, you just got rear-ended because it gives you all of a sudden, you know, you would, you would slow down without, and it was so abrupt that it didn't make sense. Or, or, you know, you just went over two lanes and didn't put your signal on. And if you can just think about giving horses clear and their clarity like that, it, it, it can clear it up. So thank you very much. A little bit. Yeah. I think uh, we'll be, we'll be thinking about our, our blinkers. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> That's really helpful. Um, wondering about uh, your journey specifically to the elite list and the U.S. team, um, the challenges and and contra and contrast. What were the top moments for you in that piece of the journey, um, and then challenges that kind of presented themselves there? Well, um, obviously, you know, I talked. I obviously talked about the the mental challenges that I've had, uh, and and that's part of getting to Tokyo was was combating that. Um, the other part, you know, DJ's had some some injuries and and navigating that at the top level and and doing right by your horse and and making sure everything is is peaking at the right moment has, has for me been a, a huge learning process because um, doing the two Nations Cups in Europe with him was a huge. Uh, undertaking and 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 it was amazing, you know, that we that we did all of that, and and it was a, it was the first time on an international scale that I not only represented the United States but also had to travel to Europe and 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 be part of a team and 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 learn what it was to represent the team. The Olympics was that times eight thousand. I mean, it really it was it was a whole different level of pressure, of expectation. Um, I think the fact that at the time Japan was under a state of emergency and 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 under lockdown because the COVID did not help. Um, there was a lot of feeling of isolation there. But but just in general, um, the Olympics is definitely its own 
thing. And, and I am so glad to have been a part of it. I'm so proud to have been a part of it. And I, the team that I happen to be on, I could not have, I could not have been with a more uh, experienced and, and serious and, and horse friendly team that I was with. And so I'm grateful for that. And uh, I, I certainly hope that Paris is on my horizon with Don John again, and I will be the wiser for it because now that I've been through it, but I, there, there was just nothing to prepare you for what the Olympics is like until you go to the Olympics for the first time. It was pretty remarkable. So uh, lots of lots of, of, of emotions from good to bad to everything in between, but just really, really a, a, an exciting thing to have experienced for sure. I'm sure. Just incredible. Everyone, everyone always says that. So I, I can't imagine the range of emotion. Um, just a couple questions have come in in the chat, just kind of sure. specifically as you've moved, as you've moved through this, this incredible journey has, have you decided to wear, um, you know, a different type of equipment because of your accident? Are you wearing an air vest now where before you didn't, uh, changed any brands of helmets and things like that? Um, um, in terms of my equipment, um, no, I, I wear, I wear a cask helmet. I happen to be sponsored by cask helmets and I, and I do, they, they, I do feel very secure in them. I'm not saying that to promote them, but I, the, the helmet, um, no, I've not changed anything. I do have a student that I teach that wears a, a air vest and I have never considered wearing one myself, but I do know it's out there and, um, I, I'm not there yet. I, 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 I feel like my change has really been in my preparation before I get on each horse. I think I'm far more um, aware of not taking unnecessary risks. Um, I am, doesn't care, I don't care which horse it is. I will never, ever, ever get on a horse um, without, without jogging it up and down a couple steps first. Um, these are just things that I've done. Other horses, if, if there's even a question that they might be fresh, I'll just lunge it. Um, these are the things that just help me feel more in charge of what's going to happen when I put my foot in the stirrup. Um, I, I knock on wood. I have to say that uh, the times that I've really come off have been on, in the mounting area. Usually when I'm going and riding, I think because you are in the moment with the horse and, and actually communicating with the horse, unless something truly out of the ordinary happens, we generally can, can um, feel or, or diffuse or accommodate anything that may or may not happen. Whereas getting on and off your horse, you're just, you're, your foot's going over their back. You, you're, you're, just, you're just helpless at that moment. So um, no, the answer is no, I haven't. I, girth, I, I definitely use the, the girth friendly, you know, Steuben in particular has the four-way stretch girth with that with and I have two girthy horses and and they both thrive on that so that's a real um, important piece of our equipment for sure thank you um there's a question about you mentioned you know on the ground preparation do you have a, a personal trainer or any kind of uh you know groundwork for yourself body work that you do for yourself um, I, off the horse um I do I do work out um I, I try to keep myself uh as in shape as possible, even though yeah, the horses uh, keep me pretty fit. Um, so I do, uh, I do work out at the gym, um, mostly to just keep my core strength up and, and, and fitness. Um, I should probably, we all probably should uh, do some sort of stretching and, and, and yoga. And I know that when I was part of the team and um, we, uh, it's actually a funny story The we were at the barn and because you were, uh, expected to go from your hotel to the to the venue and, no, and nowhere else that's what we did but uh adrian uh, lyle who was one of my teammates um was her shoulder was bothering her and at the very end of of our stay there right before they competed they said oh we'll come to the u.s training headquarters and we have a whole facility and we show up there and it's like the wizard of oz where everything and anything is available to you and yet and and us horse riders were like stuck in the barn. So I think, I think what we need to learn as riders is that our bodies are just as important as the horses. We have everything for the horses available, but we, you know, we were, and so Adrienne went in there and her shoulder got fixed and it was amazing. And I, we were just like, okay, there's a whole nother aspect to, uh, to our sport, which is us as the riders. So, yeah. 
whoever asked that question, I, you, I should probably stretch and, and take better care of my body too. Oh, there's a, there's a mark for her. She'll have, she'll hang on to that five points for her. <laughs> uh, question about uh, whether or not you work your horses in hand. We actually had a session about long lining, which uh, uh, this year, um, which not many of us had done. Do you work with that at all? Any in hand work or long lining, anything like that? So I do. So long lining, no. I I I'm a firm believer in in lunging, um, um, not to not to just get their energy out. But I really do believe a horse that lunges well, one you can you can evaluate him really nicely. You can see how his body's looking and the soundness of your horse. But I also think a good lunging session where you can walk, where you can move your horse through the arena is. Uh, and and what I do, what I do is I generally have the side reins um, fairly fairly loose, uh, just to where the where the horse will will give to them. Um, but then I run the the lunge line through the inside snaffle ring and then attach it back to the surcingle or the saddle whatever i'm lunging with and that way you can you can use i'm, I'm trying to use my hand you can you can take pressure on that inside right on that on that lunge line and as they give you can follow their mouth again and you can really get quite a lot accomplished in teaching a horse how to give to the bit and then follow the hand um, and i do that with all of my horses i have had some people uh, do in hand work. I can't say that I am proficient at it enough to where I, where I find it beneficial if I were to do it. Um, one of the horses I have to say that we just brought over was taught to pee off in the halter. And I actually find that to be very detrimental because he thinks he's supposed to pee off all the time. And so I think you have to be careful when teaching it out of context. If you're just teaching the horse mechanically, I do think there's some benefit in that. But most of the time I try to do it as much with the rider on their back as possible. If, if that's the in-hand work you're talking about. The lunging, I'm a firm believer in. Thank you. That's, mm -hmm. Again, I'll reference the, the poor folks up in Maine trying to survive the winter with their horses. They're, they're there in you the go. Same boat. Um, there was a question about when you spoke about uh, Don John's fear about the when he was gaining fear with the other horses mm -hmm. and you really had to kind of address that from yourself was that kind of you needed to focus on your breathing while you were passing horses how how exactly were the mechanics of that fix so when I realized it was becoming a problem um I think I was un, I think I was uh unintentionally avoiding situations where I thought there might be a reaction from him and I again I think it was unintentional probably subconsciously doing that but when it started to become where he was avoiding horses coming towards him i realized that i had to uh give him confidence by not reacting before there was anything to react to and i can't say i did anything specifically to get him over it other than i started trusting that he didn't have this issue before. And I re and when I realized it was me creating it, I forced myself to not ride defensively, but ride proactively and give him the confidence again. And, and, and it, it took some time. It really did. But um, it did it did come around and it did change. And thank goodness, because when you're competing over in Europe, you know, the the rings are packed and you have nowhere to go uh, if you if you aren't able to pass other horses. So um I've had a few horses that have not liked being in the warm up with other horses, and it's a, it can be a really it can be a really tricky tricky thing. Um, but I but I but I will say normally, if you can either practice with someone you know, and 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 if if you have a horse that's doing this, what I would say is find a few people that you ride with and 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 say, okay, I'm going to walk now. Can you walk by me and give the horse the teaching them that in a controlled way that that they can start getting used to other horses passing them. Thank you, that's very helpful. Um, we have a couple of uh, the questions. So if, if you, barring of course the girth tightening incident, if you had kind of uh, conceptually a thing, a do over uh, for your career, would there be a decision, uh, decision, decision point you wish you had done differently? Um, I think, I think looking back, I probably, you know, I, I, I wish I'd had more guidance. I wish I'd had a mentor maybe in the, in the, in the earlier stages. 
I think that would have maybe helped me uh, find my way a little sooner. Um, I can't say though that I would change a whole lot um, because I'm pretty I'm pretty satisfied with where I've come, and uh, I. I uh, like I said earlier, I said I, I I will take the competitive aspect of this as far as it's meant to go, and I and I'm blessed to have sponsors right now that have provided me with some really cool horses, and I don't feel a ton of pressure on me to do anything other than ride them honestly and ethically, and 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 keep them help, healthy and sound as best we can. So, no, because I I really think all the horses that have come into my life have been there for a reason, and I've learned so much from each of them. And and if my journey is 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 taking me longer than others, it's it's okay. And the the one that kind of the question that kind of pairs with that one, uh, we have you know young riders on the call today. Okay. Uh, what what piece of advice uh, did you not get as a youth that you really wish you had that little bit sooner that you just wish someone had said to you a bit sooner in your career that would have been helpful? Um, I think I think with any young person riding, especially today now with with social media, I can't imagine how difficult it must be to navigate not comparing yourself to maybe what others are doing and and maybe how seemingly quickly or easy it is for other people. And I think I think the the most important thing I can say to to anybody, but but especially young riders is, you have to be willing to put in the work and you have to be willing to deal with the ups and downs of this. This is, this is a really tough sport because you're dealing with an animal and uh, take, the, take the wins and enjoy them. But, but I think the one thing I tell to all my students and I, and I, and I actually made a little note of this because I think it's a really important piece of this competitively. I tend to show my horses at the level they're training, be it training level or pre-St. George or even Grand Prix, um, because I want to use the competition as a educational moment to see where they're at, what they might need to get better at, where, where some holes are, what I need to work on to, in order to make these things happen in the show environment. So that doesn't always mean that I'm going to get the score that I ultimately wanted or the first place ribbon. You have to be okay with using competition as an educational marker for where we are. And, and it's, and I think the moment we only base our value or our, our, our enjoyment on how we're doing at the shows, that's, that's going to lead you down a path that, that might not end, end well successfully. So young riders, Put in the hard work and and really be open to to learning even from the 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 more difficult moments because even at the Olympic level we all have challenges that we have to overcome. So I I I, I and 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 if you can find a mentor or somebody that you really believe in, stick to a system. You know, find learn the basics, learn learn what it is to really ride. And then venture out and 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 find your own path. But but soak up all the information and education you can while you have it available to you for sure. Thank you. And then one parting question that just came in in the chat, which is mad I didn't think of it myself. Um, if you are someone who wants to show that you're supportive of talking about these kinds of anxieties and things like that with, um, you know, someone who you think may have just gone through something, what what is the best way? You know, you don't want to put them on the spot. Um, what would be your recommendation for the best way to kind of indicate through conversation that you're open and available without really kind of pushing for details or looking like you're, you're, you know, hunting for gossip or anything like that? Oh, gosh, um, I, I, I can only speak for myself, but I, if someone were to, if someone were to sincerely show an interest in, in, in or notice that I was struggling, I would, I would be grateful or, or appreciative of it. So I think it's just in how you ap approach the person. I, I can't imagine anybody struggling, um, not responding positively to sincerity. So I, I, I think I think the last thing that anybody wants to feel is like there's a stigma attached to, to this. So to tiptoe around it might make them even feel more awkward. So if there's a genuine need or, or desire to help, 
just privately bring it up. And, and, and if they're not wanting to talk about it, I think they'll, they'll, that person will let you know. But again, for me, I would, I was, you know, I kept it, I kept it down because I kind of felt like I was supposed to, but boy, it felt good to, to tell people at the moment what I was going through. And it was, it was part of what, part of what is part of what still helps me get through it. So if, if you can be that person, I encourage you to do it. Well, thank you very much. We really appreciate your time. Um, I know uh, that we're a couple of minutes early, but we've uh, run through all of our questions. Um, and I can't, I can't thank you enough. This was really, truly um, an incredible session. And you'll, I don't know if you want to look in the chat, there's a lot of thank yous um, and comments about people who are just really thankful that someone at your level is willing to discuss this, um, you know, because adult amateurs are also scared to get on some days. It's, it's hard to talk about, um, you know. Well, like I said, it, it really changed me as a, as a teacher as well, because I, I forgot before all this, what, what, what I didn't know what fear was. And so it was hard to teach someone that was afraid because you're just like, don't be afraid. Just, just get on and ride your horse. And now, and now that I, now that I know what it is, it's, it's real. And, uh, you know, I don't want to cater to the fear. I never want to give into my fear, but I also want to understand it. And I certainly understand it when I'm teaching, uh, people that, that do feel fear as well. And so, and it, we can all get through it. It just, we need to talk about it and find ways to help us feel confident in the process. Well, thank you so much. I think this, this was, this was, uh, I'm being told this was one of the best sessions of the year and certainly the best one, I think, to end our, end our webinar oh. series on. And I hope we all have really great conversations and great, great year as the competition season up North unthaws and, and begins. So Nick, I hope you have a really, really great, incredible year that it's certainly, uh, certainly seems you're deserving of it so uh, I wish truly you appreciate all the best. it and nice to thank meet you. kind of everybody I'll, I'll wish you all well and thank you for having me yes thank you so much for your time and thank you everyone as always for the wonderful questions you always make this better so we'll go ahead and and end and we'll catch you all again next January and looking forward to seeing how the year goes for you Nick thank you thank you bye-bye everyone